Beat him. Am I wearing this thing right? Like a rock star. Well, it's good to see everybody back this evening as we uh, study the third part of these lessons. Remember that as we uh, look into these things, uh, this is God communicating with us. Uh, this is his revealed word. Uh, this is how he talks to us today. And so these lessons are designed to encourage us and uh, always for someone who is not a Christian to repent and come to God the right way but they're also designed to strengthen us and to help us understand who we are and what we have. It's important that we understand what we have. Uh, we have something special in worshiping God. It's what God requires. And those who worship him according to his will and serve him according to his will be with him forever. Now, we looked at those things this morning in the Old Testament. Uh, but don't forget that what Romans uh, 15 says, uh, those th things written for time were written for our learning. And so we have to go back to the Old Testament uh, to get the whole understanding of things, see what God is doing and what does he require of us. Now, we no longer live in the Old Testament as we know. I don't have to prove that. If anyone has questions about that, then you can see me later. But we are under the New Testament, or rather the New Covenant. And so, in Hebrews chapter 8, it says, Now the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, not man. You see, that's the true tabernacle. That's who we are today. Now, Moses started this tabernacle. God gave him the commandments, but it wasn't the final tabernacle. It was a shadow of the true tabernacle. And a shadow is not the real thing. A shadow is leading to the real thing. For every high priest is appointed to both gifts and sacrifices. Hence, it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle for See, he, he says that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on uh, the mountain. But then he says, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry. See, he's more excellent by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted on better promises. You see, and so uh, that is, is us. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, for the law, since it has only a shadow of good things to come. So it was a shadow. What we read this morning, uh, those sacrifices, the tabernacle, uh, the temple was a shadow leading us to the real thing. That is us today. We are the temple of God. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you? And so we are the temple of God. We are also the house of God. And you remember Matthew chapter 16. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 2. Let's go there quickly. But I don't want to stay there long. I just want you to get my point. Acts chapter 2. It's amazing when you teach the gospel, you always seem like, there's a high percentage of the time you're going to go to the beginning, which is the book of Acts. There's nothing uh, I can do about that. 
It's a wonderful passage. You always have to go back there. It seems to me I go back there a lot. And God designed it that way. And so what I want you to see here is that we know from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we are the temple of God. And we know from Matthew 16, 18, and 19, when Jesus walked earth, he said, I will build my church and, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against. In other words, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to die and I'm going to go into the Hadean realm for three days. And, but I'm going to come out and I'm going to build uh, what I said I was going to build. And he did. And so when he died and uh, of course he resurrected and he ascended to the father. You remember what he told Mary when he resurrected, he said, do not cling to me. Don't touch me. I have not yet gone to the father. And where did he go? He went to the Hadean realm for three days. And so when he came out, he stayed around and then he ascended back to the father. God was pleased with him. When God resurrected him from the dead, uh, Romans 8, 11, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God was pleased with him. And so he finished the work. And now we are under uh, the new covenant. Those things have served their purpose. Now we serve a new law. We have a, a new way of worshiping, not new and making up our own ideas. And, but it's what God requires. Those things that we read about this morning are finished. They are complete. But the idea, the meaning is still there. God, in the patriarchal times, did not allow them to worship him any kind of way. He punished them when they did wrong. Uh, when we get to the Mosaic system, as we saw this morning, things were written down. They knew exactly what to do. They were taught what to do. And we saw in Leviticus chapter 10, God punished them when they did not do it his way. We saw Solomon who did it his way, who followed uh, the rules of worship. But then because of women, of the things that he desired most, uh, he was drawn away from the true worship of God and God punished him. And so there's a lot more we can go through in the old covenant, but we I'm not going to go there, but God shows us plainly that you cannot tamper with his worship. And that's for us today who are under the new covenant, We're not to do that. Now watch. And so I'm going to Acts 2 again, and I want to read this quickly, and then I want to move around. And now we know that in Acts 2, this is the beginning uh, of church, the temple the kingdom that was prophesied by Daniel, the kingdom that was prophesied by Isaiah and the other prophets, is now coming into existence. Uh, Daniel, or rather Peter and the 12 spent three years with Christ. Luke chapter three, Christ was 30 years old when he started his ministry. He trained them, he developed them, he taught them. Now the Holy Spirit has come upon them. It's time to get started because the kingdom where salvation is, is coming. It's actually, it's now here. But I want you to see that they were involved in a mosaic system when the kingdom came. In the mind of God, the old law was over, but they had to, they did not understand that. God gave all that time, the necessary time for it to happen correctly. It really ended, it ended in the mind of God when Christ did what he did, but it really ended in the book of Matthew during the destruction, during the destruction of Jerusalem. That's when God totally took it away in an earthly manner. But here is when you see, and when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all with, all together in one place. On the day of Pentecost, these were uh, Jewish people who was celebrating in the Mosaic system. Worshiping God in the Mosaic system, they were doing it according to the Mosaic law. You see, and so suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind and it filled the house where they were sitting. You remember in Mark chapter nine and verse one, the kingdom will come with power, watch. Remember in Exodus chapter 40, God told Moses how to build the tabernacle. 
in Leviticus, this is what you do when you get in there. And we saw this morning when uh, God decided to build his temple, the stationary place of worship, which was in Jerusalem, Solomon was going to do that. But they were just shadows, so now here comes the real thing. See, the tabernacle is gone. Matter of fact, when the temple was built, the tabernacle was completed. But now the temple is gone, and so what, ha what do we have now? The true temple of God, which is the church. And he said, the kingdom, this temple, this house, will come with power. And so how do you know that it's going, how do you know when it is here, Disciples, how do you know when it's going to arrive? Because it's going to come with power. That's why you see, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a, rush, or like a violent rushing wind and to fill the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves. And they rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. And so they were in the Mosaic system. And notice who was there. Notice all these people, verse 7. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying, Why are not all these? Why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Notice who was there. And how is that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the district of Libya, around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews, see, and proselytes. In this mosaic system. So Peter preaches the gospel. The first gospel sermon, what Peter does, he goes to the Old Testament to prove that they crucified the Messiah. Now watch. They are Old Testament worshipers, Mosaic worshipers. And so he goes back to their prophets, to Joel, to Psalms, to prove that they crucified the Messiah. And this was not many days ago, and so they still can remember what they did many, I believe many who were there were the ones who said crucify him, crucify him. Remember the uh, day of Pentecost was 50 days after the Passover. And so they remembered. And so that's why when he proved to them from the Old Testament, why the Old Testament? Because they were Old Testament worshipers. That's why they were there worshiping God. And so when he proved to them that they crucified the Messiah, that's when they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter says, the introductory statement, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now watch. I like verse 40. And with many other words, see that? He solemnly, as Peter, testified and kept on exhorting them. And so he gave them the introductory statement, repent, be baptized, and then he continued to teach them. You see, we're dealing with men and women who were involved in the Mosaic system. They were devout. Millions were there. Now, we know that 3,000 were baptized, but millions were there. That was the day appointed. So then those that gladly received his word were baptized. Now notice this, verse 41. Verse 42, and they continued, continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers. See? They continued. They were taught. Remember verse 40, many of the words did he solemnly testify and kept on exhorting them. He had to teach them. And then when they were baptized, he continued. See, he had to teach them, and they were continually devoting, they were continually devoting themselves to, to the apostles' teaching, not the Mosaic system anymore. Now, this is a different way. It's not a, a new way in a manly sense of worshiping. It's God's new way of worship. It's a better way of worshiping. The Mosaic system is complete. They had to be taught that. 
Look at verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added, was adding their, to their number day by day such as were being saved. The King James said, Lord added to the church those who are being saved. Now watch. So they have learned to worship God. They are in this church that God had developed. They were added to those who were being saved. Who are those? It was 120 in Acts chapter 1 and verse 15. It was all those who were baptized on John's baptism. God put them in there. And those who were baptized here were added to them. Now, see, that's the tabernacle. That is a temple. Remember, do you not know that you are the temple of God? Here it is. Here it is right here. You are, he's talking about us now. We are the temple of God. We are the house of God. We are the spiritual house. We are the spiritual temple. We are, according to 1 Peter, we are the priests who make spiritual sacrifices in that tabernacle, which is us. And so everything now, the things in the Old Testament is, had been completed. It's us. But notice those who are being saved. We who are the church and those who are baptized for the mission of sins are added to the church, added to us, because in the church is where we learn how to worship God. And you have to be in his kingdom in order to, for God to accept your worship. Do you remember in the days of Moses, as we talked about this morning, God told Moses how to build a tabernacle, and this is what you do within that tabernacle. This is how you sacrifice to me. This is how you worship, to worship me in the tabernacle. You remember when, again, when Solomon was uh, 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 taught how to build the tabernacle, how to follow the design, and they worshiped, they sacrificed in this temple, or rather the temple, they, they sacrificed in the temple, and so now we are the church, the temple, the tabernacle, the house of God. And within that house is where you worship. That's why we worship God the way we do, because we are in his house. We are, in, we are his tabernacle. We are his people. And this is where you come to learn how to worship God. In the Old Testament, the priests were teachers. They taught people how to live, how to conduct themselves. And they also taught them how to worship God. And so we are the priests. We set the example. People come here to learn how to worship God. See, I don't envy anybody else. Because I'm not going somewhere else to learn how to worship God. Uh, someone of my wife's family came to the house. And it blew my mind. He came to show his respects. And I said, are you still a member of the church? I was just making conversation, and he blew my mind and said, no, I'm a member of the potter's house. Blew my mind. Wasn't expecting that. He sounded, the way he looked at me, he was kind of embarrassed. But see what happened, he looked for other places to worship. I guess he got bored with this worship. I'm not looking for another place to worship. I don't want nobody to show me how to worship. I know how to worship. Our worship according to God's will is all designed. I'm in the place. I'm staying in here to worship God. I'm not going out there to find another way. That's what they had. Now watch. I'm going to show you something. Notice the, how the devil, I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 12. Watch this. Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation 12, in a nutshell, the Satan is trying to discourage God's plan. The kingdom is coming. Remember, the church was in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. And so Genesis to the end relates to the coming of the kingdom. And the kingdom had arrived. 
The prophets prophesied about it. Things happened uh, that the devil, the devil tried to involve himself to stop it. But he couldn't. You remember uh, how when Joseph went into Egypt, uh, Joseph did not understand why he was there until the end, but at that time there was only 70 Israelites. Because of Joseph, they were able to live and grow, and they went from 70 to millions. You remember Esther, when there was a plan to try to annihilate, annihilate the Jews. But because of Esther and Mordecai, the Jews lived and grew, developed. And remember now, Satan knew, I don't know the insides of that, but Christ was coming through their seed, that bloodline. And so why not try to destroy them? You remember when Herod uh, existed when he killed those baby boys trying to get after Christ. So Satan tried to stop the plan from coming into existence. I knew he was around because in Matthew chapter 4, you see him going head to head with Jesus Christ, trying to stop him from going to the cross. Or when he goes there trying to stop, hopefully he would come down off the cross. Didn't happen. And so the plan to stop salvation, to stop the kingdom, did not work. Look at verse 10. Uh, let's go to verse 9. And, a, and the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. He lost the battle. Three times he lost. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and our authority of his Christ have come. Salva Notice this. Salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of Christ have come. See, the kingdom and salvation, they're together. You want to be saved, you have to be in the kingdom. Because in the kingdom is how you connect with the blood of Christ. In the kingdom is where God accepts the worship. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down who accused them before God day and night. Notice, and they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because the word of their testimony. And, did not, and they did not love their life even to death. But now he's not finished. Look at verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring. Who? who what offspring? Who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And so he could not stop the plan. The kingdom is here. Christ did it. Now he's on the attack, attacking the individuals. You remember what I said about that uh, man who told me he's now at the potter's house. That's what Satan does. Even though he left and went to the potter's house, the kingdom is still here. The church is still in existence. We still worship God the same way. But what happened, there was some type of temptation that drew him away. And we have to remember that Satan is walking about like a warring lion seeking whom he may devour. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. He's on the prowl trying to find a weak point. Now remember, Satan doesn't know. It's very interesting. He doesn't know. He's looking. It's interesting when God was talking to Satan about Job, God knew that Job would be the one to make it happen. Satan did not know. Satan is not all-knowing. God is all-knowing. He's seeking an opportunity. He doesn't know. God does not have to seek. God knows. Satan seeks. And so Satan is looking for opportunities. I like that. And the dragon was enraged. He's upset because the plan is in existence. The kingdom had come. Salvation is here. And he went off to make war with the rest of the offspring. Who what? Who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Now watch this. How's he doing this? Now, this relates to what we're talking about. Tampering with worship. Changing the worship. Looking for another way of worship. See, temptation. 
And so what happens now, we're not going to go into uh, this deeply uh, because this is not about the emperor. Emperor is the emperor. But Domitian at this time was the Roman emperor. And he was the one, Daniel prophesied about him, what Daniel said was right. He was the one who wanted to be like God. He thought he was God, not like God. He, in his mind, he was God. And anybody who did not worship him was an atheist. And he caused punishment with those who did not worship him. Satan got behind that mindset. That's how he done it. And he utilized him to change things. I like that. Notice what it says. And he stood at the sand of the sea in chapter 13, verse 1. And, and I saw the beast coming out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on his horns were ten diadems. And on his heads were the blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard. And his feet was like those of a bear. And his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him power and his throne and great authority. Satan got behind him. He found an opportunity to attack. He's doing it today. Notice what happened. And I saw one of the heads as it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. Rome, Domitian, all-powerful, had one of the greatest militaries that ever existed. People thought, wow, he must be God. No one can defeat him. So many, many, I believe, I'm inclined to believe, even those in the church left, and they followed and worshipped him. Because when you get to Revelation chapter 20, he calls them cowards. See, notice this. And they worshiped the dragon because he gave authority to the beast. And so when you worship another way, you're worshiping the devil. Well, the Bible says and they worshiped the dragon because he gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying who was like the beast and who was able to make war with him. And there was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act 42 months was given to him and he opened his mouth and blasphemy and blasphemies against God and blasphemy blasphemy his name listen to this and his tabernacle that is those who dwell in heaven and it was given to him to make war with the saints and overcome them and authority on every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him and all who dwell on the earth will worship him everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who has been slain see through this leader satan is attacking the church notice you see the word worship here worship worship attack the worship Stop worshiping God. When you stop worshiping God, you start singing praises the way he wants you to sing praises. When you stop worshiping God, you no longer take the communion the way God wants you to take it. You no longer give the way he wants you to give. Your heart is no longer devoted to him. When your heart goes away from God, you are devoted to something else. See, and do not think that Satan is not. Satan is behind it 100%. Now watch this. I'm not finished yet. They're going to be punished. Notice chapter 15 and verse 8. Go there with me, please. Watch. And the temple, you remember we looked at that in the book of Exodus? We looked at how the glory of God filled the temple? Or rather the tabernacle? We saw the same thing with the temple, how the glory of God filled the, te the tabernacle, or rather the uh, glory of God filled the temple. It filled the tabernacle first with Moses, and then when uh, uh, Solomon did what he did, the glory of God filled the temple. Here is the church who are worshiping God according to his will, and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and his power, and no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Now watch. God is going to punish them. But notice how the glory of God filled. The temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues and the seven angels were finished. In other words, God is still with the church. 
And he's going to punish the church. Or rather, not the church. He's going to punish those who are affecting the church in a negative way. And there is going to be no one that would be able to intercede. No one is going to happen. Now, I, watch this. I look at here, here, Ezekiel chapter 14 and verse 13. Watch this. This is the point. When God was going to punish the Jews for what they were doing in his temple, they were worshiping him in other strange ways. And God had enough. You see that in Ezekiel chapter 8, Ezekiel chapter 9, God had enough of their false worship. And so now he's going to punish them. And it says, even though the, these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in its midst, by their own righteousness, they could not, they could only deliver themselves. Son of man, if, I, if a country sins against me by committing unfaithfulness, I will stretch out my hand against it, destroy it, destroy its supply of bread, send a famine against it, and cut off from it both men and beasts. So God is going to destroy it. It's the same thing here. So I'm going to send this plague because of what they've done to my church. I'm going to cause a plague because of what they've done to my people. And no one is going to be able to come in. This glory is so powerful that no one will able to see to make intercession in this temple. In other words, it's going to happen. You can't play with God's worship. Now watch, God did it. I'm going to show you something. I want you to see this before we go to the next step, and then I'm going to close. That's the plague. Seven plague complete. It's going to be a destruction God's going to destroy. Remember, Satan was behind it. He's going to, they're going to have to pay the price for uh, messing with God's worship. Notice this, Revelation chapter 20 and uh, verse 4. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. And those who had not worked, see that? Who, and who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and upon their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. They did not worship the beast. They stuck to the worship of God. Stick those things that you have learned from the beginning. First John 2, 24. Notice verse 10. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast, that's Rome, they all had their part in tampering with the worship of God. And they will, listen to this. The beast and the false prophet are also, see that? And false prophet also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. You cannot tamper with God's worship and get away with it. Now, watch 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to bring this home in a minute, so stay with me. I know it's evening service. If you didn't take a nap, that's your problem because I had a good nap. Watch this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we know that Paul gave instructions from the Holy Spirit how to partake of the Lord's Supper. And they were disrespecting the worship of God, doing it the wrong way in an unworthy manner, verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So let a man examine himself and let him eat of the bread and drink the cup. You better do it right. Why? It's God's worship. Notice the punishment. For he who eats and drinks, eat, he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason is his worship. For this reason, many of you are weak and sick and a, and a number sleep. Whoa. This is New Testament worship can't fool around with God's worship. That's the consequences of disrespecting the Lord's Supper. See, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we need to understand that we, have, we need to have 100% respect. This is the design that God put together. God said to remember the death of his son every Sunday. How often? Every Sunday. Man does not have the right to choose what Sunday to do it. Sunday comes, you do it on Sunday. Our heart has to be devoted to that. We have to respect 
the Lord's Supper. I've been to congregation when people were, were doing the Lord's Supper, there were people talking, doing whatever, not respecting the Lord's Supper. It's dangerous. Maybe that's why some people are not, things are not going right. Maybe sometimes that's why people are suffering. Maybe. This is a serious matter. This pertains to the death of his son who sacrificed himself, who gave himself just for us. And the pain with the torture was so severe that I don't even want to think about it. When you get into the history of it, I don't know how Christ was able to do it. The torture that he took upon himself just for mankind, and some people don't want to remember that. And we take it lightly. When I say we, I mean we in general. It's a serious matter. It's time to remember the death of his son. And you're thankful that God sent his son, that we don't have to uh, face the wrath of God because of his son. And so he says you better be careful. That's a warning. It's a serious matter. And watch. We're going to close with this one. Revelation 22, 18 and 19. And here's why I'm going here. Watch this. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophets of this book. If anyone adds to them, God shall add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of the prophecy, God shall take away his part from the tree of life and the holy city which are written in this book. James chapter 3 and verse 1. For those false teachers. Let not many of you become teachers, brethren, my brother, knowing such we shall incur a stricter judgment. Nobody gets away with anything. You cannot tamper with the word of God and get away with it. Those men who started those false religions will pay. I tell you, according to the Bible, I'm not, it, 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 this is not a misjudgment. This is what the Bible teaches about false teachers, and they were false teachers. They started a worship that is not in the Bible. You mean to tell me you think they are in paradise will be transferred in heaven for eternity? If you believe that, you're lying to yourself. I can say according to the Bible, it's not a misjudgment. Based on what they taught, they are in Tartarus and will be transferred to heaven for eternity. You cannot change, understand that, you cannot change the worship of God and get away with it. Look, this is just something, uh, it has been estimated that the Catholic Church has over 68 million members. You mean to tell me the one who started that will not be punished? The Southern Baptist, over 16 million. This was uh, from years ago, and so I'm sure it has increased. The United Methodist, started by John Wesley, has over 7 million members. I'm sure it increased. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, over 6 million members. I'm sure it has increased. The Church of God in Christ has over 5 million members. The Assembly of God, over 3 million members. African Methodist Episcopal Church, 2 million members. Lutheran Church, over 2 million members. Episcopal Church, over 1 million members. Jehovah Witness, over 1 million. Seventh-day Adventist, over a million. I'm sure it increased. So now all these people have decided because of one man to worship God a different way. And one leads to another. So millions and millions are following that false doctrine. You mean to tell me they're not going to pay? Oh, yes. If everyone else paid for tampering with the worship of God, that means they will also. I know it sounds harsh, but I want us to see that as members of the church so we don't fall into that pattern. He said, if any man preaching to you any other gospel contrary to that which you have received, let him be accursed. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 9. In other words, you are separated from God. You are destined. Your destiny is hell. So they taught a different gospel. They developed another style of worship. And so no one gets away with anything. Now watch this. We'll close with these. We know that we, don't, we do not worship with instruments. No. Why? Because we cannot add or take away from God's word. This is what it is. We have been warned from the Old Testament, even the New, that we must stick to the style of worship. 
Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, and speaking to one another in Psalms and heavenly spiritual song, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. And so our singing, this is worship. Well, always giving, th- always, if I'm always giving thanks, I always must sing according to the gospel. I can't change it. There's no instruments here. Nothing is here. Because God designed us, I'm always giving thanks for all things in the name by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. And so I'm singing praises to them. What? According to his will. You remember Solomon? They worship God with instruments and etc. In 2 Chronicles chapter 29 and following, we found out that Solomon, Solomon was doing it according to the plan of God. That was an Old Testament worship. This is New Testament. James chapter 5 and verse 13. If any man among you afflicted, let him pray. If any Mary, let him sing psalms. No instrument. Mark 14, 26. After singing a hymn, they went out to Mount Olives. No instrument. He's introducing it. Jesus is. Acts 16, 25. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. No instrument. Paul was a Pharisee. He was used to instrumental music. When he became a Christian, there's no instrument. 1 Corinthians 14, 15. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I I will sing with the understanding also. No instrument. Those who added the instruments have changed it and will suffer the consequence of that sin. It's a sin. Understand that sin is breaking God's law. And so when you temper God's, his, his worship, you sin against God. So you're going against his law. There's consequences for that. And so many people are, were happy this morning, praising God and serving God and worshiping God according to man's doctrine and uh, feeling good about it thinking because they feel good about it, that God is also feeling good about it. No. You remember Nadab and Abihu? They were happy making those changes. They were happy making those changes. They assumed because they were happy, God would be happy. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. Don't think because you're happy, God is happy. People do that too much because I'm happy. This is a wonderful thing. Oh, look how, see, people look at the tangibles, the things that they can, they can see. Look how, look at how many, oh, this, we just have, we are increasing tremendously. Our youth, boy, we have one from 10 youth to, to 40 youth. We have a great amount of, uh, youth. we're doing a wonderful thing here. I'm glad we changed the worship. I know it's a wonderful thing because look how many people we have. Mm-mm. Only way for me to determine if God is happy by looking into his word. There could be a thousand people. Joel Osteen, when you look at that place, I don't know how many people, there's a lot of people there. And in their eyes, that's a wonderful thing. He was on the Oprah Winfrey show. He was on different shows. They have books. It's a wonderful thing. Why? He's attracting millions and millions of people. People are following that doctrine. At the end, he says, you confess Christ in your heart. You will be saved. You don't think he's going to pay for that? Yes, he will. I don't want to be part of that. Remember when Moses, or rather Noah, walked the earth, the entire world was sinning against God. Only eight souls please God. And so I want to be with the eight. Three, six, nine, 12, 13, 14, 15. This is the place to be. If we're worshiping God according to his will, it doesn't matter if there's 500 people next door that's worshiping God. They have wonderful facilities. Everything's going so well. If everything, oh, it's just wonderful. And they're not doing it according to God's will. I don't want to be there. I want to be with the 15. Because when I go home, my conscience is clear. And when I go home at night, I thank God for allowing us to be able to worship him according to his will. And I hope that, God, you are satisfied. That's what I want.
Remember, we are preparing ourselves to go to heaven. I'm going to say this quickly. I'm inclined to believe that when we leave here, and I'm going I'm to say that we all will make it in. I'm just going to think in a positive note. Because if you have sinned against God, you have time to repent. Right now, you're still living. There, I don't believe it's going to be giving in heaven. That, wor that worship is, what are we going to give for? I don't believe that's going to happen. I don't believe that in, in heaven there will be communion. What are we going to remember? It's complete. What style of worship, what part of worship do I believe that we will continue to do in heaven? The angels sung. In the book of Job, they sung at the foundation. Uh, when Christ was born, you see them singing. So you look into the heavenly realm, angels sing to God. They were created. They sing. They worship God. Revelation, they're singing to God. So I'm inclined to believe that that part of worship will carry us. We will do that same thing, sing praises to God. Remember, you got to understand, as God put together the singing, it was in the Old Testament, the singing. God told them they could sing on musical instruments. And so now that's complete. We are still singing. I believe God loves the singing to him. That's why it's important that our heart is devoted to him because he wants to appreciate and love our singing. I believe he loves good singing. Don't you like good singing? I'm going to tell you something. Whitney Houston, who destroyed her life, destroyed it. I have never heard anyone sing like that before. Beautiful voice. I love good singing. Another favorite group that I, back in the day, were the Temptations. I'm just going to confess it. Singing. There's singers that you just love. People could sing. You don't think God loves good singing? The singing. He said, this is how you must sing to me because I want to hear it. But our hearts must be right. And so you're living right with God. You sacrifice yourself for God. You're having a wonderful life. You're living for God. You're devoted to God. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, Saturday, whatever you do that's wrong, you make it right with God. You're living for God. And you come Sunday, you're singing to him. And he hears it. When you're down and out, you feel sad, you start singing to God. You're praying, you're singing. He hears it. Respect it. Don't tamper with it. You don't think he's going to punish those who tamper with that? Yes, he will. If we can help you, please come out. We stand and sing the song of invitation.